So very good um, morning in Jesus' name. And may God bless you and keep you. So we are going to continue our teaching on uh, the Perfect Redemption Plan 5. And what we were covering is uh, actually uh, uh, we stopped here, uh, be made perfect and whole, and um, and be, be made perfectly whole and be made perfectly sound in the mighty name of Jesus. What I will advise you is also either to listen to those. Uh, recordings you already made in a playlist listen to them because there are some testimonies that are there that i may not repeat in uh, this uh, course and uh, the other thing if you read it is even uh, better but at least if you don't have the time to read listen that's why we made it easy for for people to li at least they can listen on average you will retain more uh, for, uh, information about the subject if you read than if you listen. You need to listen to that at least uh, four times a uh, recording to retain the same information than if you read it. And if you read it and you make you take notes, you actually even uh, retain it. Uh, um, twice as much than if you just uh, write it. That's why God always said to people, write down the vision, write it down. And as you write down, God is going to speak uh, more. Start having a diary and a journal and then writing what God is saying to you, the words that God is saying. And you, you are going to see that God is going to expand, expand. God gives you only a word and they expect you to start writing. And as you write what it means, you will just see now him pouring out uh, of you in the name of Jesus. So there are some testimonies that I may not repeat. And uh, uh, so let's go through the be made perfectly whole and be made perfectly sound in the name of Jesus. So when we look at uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, the Bible tells us uh, that if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, uh, which he commands you, uh, so, okay, uh, if you diligently hearken or heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his uh, commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the these, uh, diseases upon you, which uh, I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Or I am the Lord, uh, your physician, or I am Jehovah. Rafa or Rafika. So then when people read this verse, he said they say that okay, so God puts some diseases on people. Uh God judges some people, those who hate him and those who persecute his children. So God, it is a judgment. So on all those plagues in Egypt were judgment of God against those, those who hated him and were trying to kill his children. But you and I, we are his children. They don't hate him. We love him. So we should not fear anything coming on us. No. So, so some people will say, okay, so is HIV the judgment of God on the ungodly? No. HIV is the foolishness of the people. So even if a Christian decide to live in sexual immorality, catches an STD, that was not the judgment of God over him, it was a sowing and the reaping. He sowed uh, in the flesh of the flesh, he reaped corruption. That was not the judgment of God. He did not uh, attack, attack the, the children of God or attack the church and so on and so forth. But uh, Pharaoh, that was trying to kill God's people, God killed him. Uh, the Egyptians that were putting people in uh, slavery and uh, so on and so forth, God uh, plagued them. So that's why I always say, be careful the way you treat the Christians. And God is going to resist you the way because of the way you are treating some of uh, his children. In marriage, 
be careful the way you treat your spouse because otherwise uh, your prayers are going to be hindered because you are so close to one another so it is easier to hurt one another if someone is not closer to you he can't hurt you if he says something you won't even uh, be bothered when we were in africa uh there are no asylum uh, places where they will lock up uh, people with mental or real mental uh, diseases uh, like here in Europe. Uh, so there are some of them, but uh, they are neglected by the government. So most of the time you will see really mad, uh, raging mad people like the madman of Gadara walking in the streets, uh, sometimes even naked, eating uh, garbage. Uh, if someone like that insults you uh, in the street, will you be offended that uh, he insulted you? No, you just know he's mad. <laughs> so it won't even hurt you one bit at all because you, you even pity him or her. Uh, so you don't truly really take it uh, personal. Uh, the same thing as well, uh, when someone is not that close to you and uh, you don't even know him from Adam, when he comes and attacks you, insults you, it may offend you, but not as much as someone that you love. We are going to see it later on. The more you sacrifice for people, the more you keep your obligation towards people, the more you fall in love with them, the more what they say to you uh, is important and the more painful it is when they betray you or let you down so now people have that's why sometimes women they always feel more hurt because uh, they keep the obligation towards the man but the man truly is not reciprocating the obligation towards her uh, the one. that's why she loves more the man and that's why many times she, they are the one that um, hurt the most when there is a breakup. That's why also with the children as well, the parents have more obligation. That's why they love more the children. But sometimes the children, when they were just like here, they will just put the mother into the nursing home. Uh, the mother is still moving and so on and so forth. But the moment the dad died, okay, or the mom died, uh, we don't have time for you. Go directly to the nursing home. So you see them walking uh, in the care home. They are walking, the, the man and the woman, they are, they them my feet. But the children decided to put them in a nursing home. Uh, if, I, if the parent did that to, to you, uh, so. But because the children did not feel like they had obligation to take care of the parents, and they will not even visit, they will not even call, at all. It, it was a one-way obligation that was kept. But we are going to teach in the future how to, to instill it in children to keep obligations back to you. And that's how God wants. Otherwise, uh, we lose our children. We, um, that's not the way God wants it. So it's the Lord that uh, heals us. He's not the one that gives us the sickness. He's, he puts his judgment on uh, those who hate him, those who attack his, uh, his children. Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church. God said to him, it is hard for you to be kicking against the goats. Uh, if you don't stop, then you are going to be uh, killed. Because that's what Joshua chapter 24 says. So Paul immediately repented because he knew that God was out there to kill him. So when uh, uh, Elimas the sorcerer who was uh, preventing the proconsul uh, Paulos to receive uh, Christ, Paul pronounced a judgment on him and they struck him with blindness. So that was a judgment on any master sorcerer. Are you a sorcerer? No. Are you the one that is trying to prevent people from receiving Christ? No. If you don't want to receive Christ for yourself, that's fine. You can go to hell. That's, that's your own choice. God is not the one sending you. You sent yourself to hell. But if now you go out on your, uh, of your way to now prevent everybody to, re, to re, receive Christ, or you are in trouble with God. So he's the Lord that were healer. For us, his children, he's our healer. So, uh, like I said, the Hebrew word 
uh, Rafa or Rafika to the means uh, to repair. Whatever it is broken, God wants to repair it, to fix it. Uh, he wants to heal it. He heal it. He wants to make it whole. Make it whole. Nothing missing and nothing uh, broken. He's our healer. He's our physician. He's our medical doctor. So in the Old Testament, for instance, we have the example of a king. Uh, uh, the, the king of Syria he had a general called uh, Naaman, and Naaman had uh, um, leprosy, and uh, he was sent. Uh, uh, by that little girl that was working in his house to go to Israel and in Samaria there, there is a prophet uh, that is called Elisha and he is able to cleanse him from that leprosy and uh, Naaman rightly say that no one can, the king of Israel say no one can cure leprosy except God, yes, and in my God, yes, nobody can perform healing, even if God does the healing, it, he does it through us, so it is not us doing the healing, though he's using us, it is uh, God performing the healing through us in the name of Jesus because of the atoning sacrifice of his son. We should never forget it because many times it goes into our head that we are the healer. No, we are not the healers. Christ is the healer. We are just uh, vessels, vehicles, uh, conduits through which, uh, through whom he is uh, piping uh, his uh, healing anointing through. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, Naaman came and he was uh, cleansed, not just cleansed from leprosy, because when you have leprosy, uh, you are contagious, okay, your skin uh, is affected, uh, sometimes your, even your nerve endings are affected, that's why uh, you lose, uh, you don't feel anything anymore, your toes, your uh, fingers are cut off. Uh, you don't feel anything at all, even someone cuts your, your toes, uh, it attacks your nerves. It eats up your eye and all your mucuses. Uh, so that's why most of the blind people, uh, most of the, the the people who have leprosy, they end up suffering with also uh, blindness because it would attack the, the mucuses, so the eye, the nose, you eat up your nose, it's start decomposing, your skin is raw, uh, um, is just rotting before your very own eye. You stink like death. Truly, it is death. You stink like death. Uh, so when Naaman dipped himself uh, for, uh, seven times in that the river, uh, the Jordan, it was not just a cleanse, so meaning he, the, 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 the wounds have uh, been healed and then uh, the, the, the infections have stopped, but he was also restored. So the skin was just like uh, that of a baby, the Bible says, and uh, better than that, even if he had the uh, uh, toes and nails and eyes that were gone, ears that were eaten up by that leprosy, God recreated everything. So you need to believe God for total wholeness. And many times when we read our Bible in English, especially the new rendering of the Bible that we are reading, there are some words that are no longer put there. They are, they are watering down the translation. Even the New King James does not say they were made whole, it said they were made well. They are removing the word uh, wholeness that was uh, in uh, the King James. They are watering down the more, they are watering down the more, but uh, we need to go back to the Bible and read it the way it is uh, in the name of Jesus. When we look at uh, Luke chapter 17, uh, also uh, God uh, made uh, those uh, lepers. Uh, uh, he cleansed them and made them completely whole. There were, there were 10 lepers that came to, to Jesus to be healed. So he sent them to the priest, go check, and you will see that you are healed. Um, so they went uh, on the way, the leprosy, the skin, uh, the, the wounds were healed, healed. They say, oh, praise the Lord. So, but one of them out of the 10, decided to come back to glorify the Lord. He was a Samaritan. So you see, he was not even a Jew. He was a Samaritan. So he was not in the covenant. He was out of the covenant. But God is, uh, it is the, the heart of God to even heal people that are not uh, saved so that they can be saved. That's the purpose. So I've prayed for a lot of people that were not saved yet for the businesses. And when the business boomed, pray for the businesses. 
Then he said, you send his wife. Gracie, go to, go to that Bible study. <laughs> and then eventually himself, he gives the life to Christ. His father gives the life to Christ. His mother gives the life to Christ. Whatever the problem, the people like listen and pray for them out, uh, 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 out loud so that he hears your prayers. And they will go, not a long prayer with uh, 15 minutes, no, one or two minutes prayer. That's all you need. And when you go home now, then that's when you do the real prayer. But the way when you are telling him uh, that prayer out loud or saying that prayer out loud, Jesus says, the reason why I'm speaking like that uh, in public is so that you may know that I am He. So that when the miracle happens, you know where it came from. And you remember what I prayed for. And when it came to pass, you knew exactly that uh, this is what uh, so, so, so prayed for me. And it has come to pass. People pay attention. So don't pray a half an hour prayer in the streets. No, pray one minute, even the office. If they ask you pray, uh, to have this, this, this uh, confidentially, okay, pray just a one minute prayer. But the target was they say that uh, the problem was, it is not about the length of the prayer. But at home, continue to pray. And then you are going to win them one by one in Jesus' name. And they, as God answered, they would come back. Oh, actually, what you pray, it is better now. My, my mom is improving. Ah, well, well. So you, they say about, they tell you about something else. So you pray again. And they keep on coming. You are, it's a bait. Prayer is a bait. So you see what the fish is biting. That's why you cast your, your line <laughs> and your worm at the end of the hook. So he came back. And he glorified God. He prostrated before the Lord, so he worshipped him. So healing for the sake of healing is not what God wants. God wants them to be healed so that at the end they can receive the, give their life to Christ. We should never forget uh, that. The purpose of the healing is so that uh, the, uh, the healing is so that the people can give their life to Christ. And these people have zero intention of uh, giving their life to Christ uh, from the very beginning. I don't want your Jesus, okay? Uh, praise the Lord, so that's fine. If they are open to the gospel, then you pray for them. And then uh, I ask God does his part, and then you tell them about giving their life to Christ. And coming to your church, you should not be ashamed. of uh, If you give birth to a child, will you give, go and uh, or you give birth to your child? Will you go and take it uh, to the dump it in front of the, how do you call those people, the foster care? Uh, people, okay, I, I gave birth to the child, but I don't want that child. No. You bring it to where Ryan Abanke did a wonderful job of winning souls. But the problem was, as he won the souls, when they would come back the next year, we could not trace where those millions have gone properly. They were not uh, put in the church. So they were saved, but they remained very carnal, or they went to some dead churches and they did not go. And that's not the model that God had in the book of Acts. They led them to Christ, they put them in the same churches, and then they put them in the church, and the people grew. So that leper that came back and glorified God, he was made completely whole. The other ones were only cleansed, but this one was made whole. So whatever he had lost because of the leprosy, the Lord cured everything in Jesus' mighty name. So uh, Jesus said, if you if your hand causes you to sin, for instance, uh, cut it off. So uh, and for it is better for you to enter uh, in life uh, uh, maimed than having the two hands and going to hell. Uh, into the fire that shall never be quenched. That's in Mark chapter 9, verse uh, 49. So when you are reading your Bible, try to find all the definitions by the Bible, not by your, especially not by your Oxford Dictionary, because they don't believe in some things. That's why they changed the definitions of words. Uh, according to Jesus, Someone who is maimed is someone who has an amputated hand. Or 
okay? According to Jesus. Someone who is maimed is someone who has an amputated hand. So when you read from the Bible that the maimed were made whole, it meant that people that had amputated hands grew back. So what kind of Bible are you reading? That's why in Azusa Street, when William Seymour laid hands on people, amputated arms grew and from the, even the shoulder blade was gone. So it was in a hole. And then the whole arm in two seconds grew back with even the nails. Another guy uh, that was working at the rail uh, truck, so a train uh, cut his, uh, his foot, uh, his leg, sorry, and it was amputated above the knee. So he came, the, the wound was still fresh. So they were trying to put the prosthesis on it. So he came. And William Seymour said, God is going to, to heal your, your leg. So he thought, oh, God is going to cause the wound to, 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 to dry up and then there will be a wonderful scar quickly instead of me having that wound for four months or three months because he just got the accident yesterday. They said, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, God is going to grow you back a new leg. And he said to the people that were there, do you remember the other guy that uh, came uh, that uh, the cement mixer had taken away the whole arm, how God grew it. He said, yes. So do you want to see another miracle like that? He said, yes, amen. They lay hands. And then the foot, God recreated the whole foot. Some people collapsed uh, because they could not fathom. <laughs> That's why if you don't believe in creation, you build that devilish thing of evolution, you are doomed. My Bible says God created. There are some teachings that the enemy has sent even through the schools. Well, not only a reptile and um, frogs can grow new limbs, new skin. So it says who? Jesus cleansed that leper, new skin. And uh, Naaman cleansed that leper. Naaman was cleansed by Elisha, a new skin, like a serpent would. Uh, put off the old skin and have a brand new skin you need to believe in creation in the beginning god created not the big bang not an evolution it's up to you what you believe and it's going to be done unto you according to you, your faith the word faith is pcc what you believe in your heart so it is very crucial what you hear to determine what you believe was made whole, perfectly whole. So when you read your Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John again, when you see the word made, I was looking, I, because God was talking about, talking to me about amputated uh, arms growing, amputated legs growing. And as you read the application of preservation plan, that's what uh, we will be telling, talking, uh, um, mentioning there as well. And I did not see it, I say, because you are reading your Bible in the 21st century. Read the definition of maimed and lame. I read it. And I say, oh, is that what, yeah, that's what I mean. So for me, someone who is uh, maimed is someone that does not have a hand. Okay? I say, yes, Lord. And it is written in Mark chapter 9, verse 40, 43. Someone who is lame is not someone that is paralyzed. Look at the definition of Jesus in verse 49. So, so if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life how lame. So according to Jesus, someone who is lame is someone who has no foot. The foot has been amputated. So when you read that Jesus made the lame whole, so those who had no legs, no feet, it was chopped off or they were born without. Jesus caused those legs to grow back. Even Wigglesworth, another guy came, he had a chopped uh, on your stump of the foot. So the foot was chopped off. And he said, go buy a pair of shoes. So that man went to the shop, said, I want a pair of shoes. The shoe salesman looked at him. He just laughed. You only have one foot. The other one is a stump. He said, I don't care. Bring me size so and so. Brought him the size that he wanted. As soon as you put the, the good shoe, foot in the shoe, and then as soon as you put the stump in the other one, the foot grew out. We need to believe the word of God literally. If we don't, then we are in trouble. 
we are never going to experience the power of God. It's going to tell us things, but we are reading uh, the Bible with uh, the Oxford Dictionary definition of words. When the Bible says the cripple, yeah, the cripple, they want the one that went wheelchairs having a, 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 a crutch, yeah, that's the cripples. Those that had palsy, uh, they do the one that were bedridden, but the legs were still there. And when God said, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that uh, the maimed one made whole and the lame walked, it means that uh, those who had amputated arms, amputated hands, and those born without, and those who had amputated the foot or uh, legs. That's why even when uh, people like Erlan, they prayed for a child that uh, was born that did not have bones in his legs, God regrew the bones instantly. Read your, that's why we wrote those Bible studies because we are no longer understanding the Bible we are reading. We are reading that with the definition that the pagan gave us of our Bible. So you can believe God for uh, what uh, he said in the Bible. So, uh, but if you look at the Webster dictionary here, for, for them, a lame is a crippled or a disabled person. That's not what the Bible says. But that's what the Webster, the Webster artist is closest to the Bible in some, some definition. But for that one, they did not believe it. They said, no, it is just a crippled and a disabled. Uh, no. Hallelujah. When God talks, talks about the blind, hallelujah. When God talks about the blind, it's not just those that still have an eyeball and then they just lost the, the, the sight. <laughs> the same Jesus in that Mark chapter 9, he said, I think I put it somewhere, uh, that if your right eye causes you to sin, do what? Pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom uh, blind or one-eyed than uh, to have your two eyes and be cast into hellfire. According to Jesus, the blinds are not just those that still have eyeballs in the sockets, even those whose eyeballs have been removed. That's why in that Luke chapter 9, hallelujah, just spat on the ground, made a clay and put it on that uh, guy because he had no eyeballs. Say, I'm still the creator. And God recreated the eyeball. Even A.A. Allen meeting, God recreated. Well, another boy had an eyeglass, like the one that uh, Liz has. And God recreated a, a, a new eyeball. And the doctor came and tested. They did not believe. I said, we don't know what is happening. We are the one who removed that, that eye. Even with uh, Tia Osborne, Daisy Osborne, his wife, she prayed for a boy that had a plastic eye. That's why we don't ask questions. The guy where the boy was blind, so she prayed, she, and then after that she tested, test. The boy was seeing everything. And then she said, hallelujah, she gave the testimony, and then someone came and said, do you know she has a plastic eye? He has a plastic eye, I said, eye, eye glass, um, a glass eye, sorry. Uh, so well, when they tested later on, God put a real eye now in that, uh, in that thing. So when Jesus says he's talking about the blind, even if you were born without uh, uh, eyeballs, and Tia lost one as well. One of the healing crew said that he had somewhere, I think in Africa, in Africa, yes. Uh, I don't know if, I can't remember if this is Kenya or elsewhere in Africa. He prayed for a wee boy that was born without uh, eyeballs. And so there was a, uh, there was not even a slit in the, uh, in the, um, so it was just like the skin that was covering everything, nothing, not even a slit. Uh, to, that these are the eyelid and uh, so on and so forth, none of that. So what he prayed and then he tested. The boy said he could see, but there's no thing. And he counted the fingers. How many fingers? Four. How many fingers? One. Amen, amen. But there was no eye. Uh, 
born. But you could see, like I said to you, eyesight is spiritual first of all, first and foremost, if you understand it. There was another guy for that uh, A.L. and prayed for a boy. God did not remove that, um, that uh, glass eye. He left it there, but the guy, the boy could see now through the eyeglass, which the doctor could not understand. You have eyeglass. How can you see through that eyeglass? I signs the world spiritual. This is just an organ. There's a spirit behind that. That's the spirit of blindness. It's a spirit. So the boy went to sleep. To sleep. In the morning, God put two tiny uh, eyeballs inside, and it was just. Uh, moving left and right so when they woke up the whole village the mother screamed my boy had now two tiny eye eyeballs the village people came down to the crusade the next day god grew directly big eyeballs in the two sockets and now the whole village gave their life to christ even the witch doctor of the village gave his life to christ so when god is talking about the blind you're not talking about those that had uh, blindness uh, through uh, cataract, uh, through uh, glaucoma and all that. Thank God for that as well, he heals it. But even when there is no eyeball in the socket, it is just the skin covering everything and nothing inside. God recreates. My prayer is that we are going to believe fully the gospel in the name of Jesus. So Jesus tells us in that Luke chapter 7, when he sent the people back to, to, to John the Baptist, he says, go tell John the things which you have uh, seen and seen and heard, that uh, the blind see. So that, that one now explains what the blind means, so the blind see. Even though if they, they were born without uh, uh, I, uh, eyeball, the lame, so you now understand the, the definition of lame here. The lame walk. So whether they were just crippled or they had no leg at all, cut off. God grew those legs. The lame now walk. The lepers are cleansed. The death, the, the death here. The dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is the one that is not offended because of me. He made them perfectly whole. So, you know, we also see uh, that uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 30 to verse 31, the Bible said, a great multitude came unto Jesus, having with them uh, those who were lame, so no uh, leg, okay, blind, dumb, and maimed, no arms or hands, and many others. And what did he do? He cast uh, the, uh, he and cast them, uh, down at uh, Jesus' uh, feet, and he did what he healed them. So, in so much uh, that uh, the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb um, to speak, the maimed to be made whole. That's why they said the maimed were made whole. It, the maimed here are not those that had a crippled hand, a withered hand. No. When it was a withered hand, the Bible said they had a withered hand in the temple. Jesus said, just stretch off your hand. The maimed, that's why they had to be made whole because the, the, the whole hand was not the, the lame, the walk, not just because uh, they were crippled and or even those that did not have legs, they recreated those legs. Even at Maurice Rural Crusade, sometimes the legs were growing back. Not that the one leg was a short and the other one, thank God, those ones were happening as well. But those that one of the uh, Maurice Russo crew said, I think it was in India, one of the child, the, the, the guy that came, he, he was a double amputee, and those two legs grew out. So the lame, he made them also to walk and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. So believe, hallelujah, that your Jehovah Rapha, he makes you whole. And when my, that's why when my brother, 
I was uh, sharing something with uh, Sister Lulu yesterday. I said, when my cousin, when I was 13, had a motorbike accident, he was paralyzed from waist down. His legs were broken. Uh, so my pastor prayed. We believed, well, we did not believe right. In our tribe, we have uh, a tribe, uh, some tribes that they call Babembes. Babembes, they, they have some traditional medicine. This is not witchcraft. It is traditional medicine that they have. Even when you have broken bones, they may have their own casts that they put with put wood and they, they would massage the bones. Even when you are born with bow legs, they will send you to the tribe. Uh, they will now, when I see some things in Europe, I say, you don't just know, you should come to my village. So <laughs> the, the, the women would be those, the many, many times the women that do that, they would be massaging uh, the child with uh, uh, warm palm oil and they would uh, pull those legs because the, the bone of a child is still uh, very tender. So you can shape it. So they will shape it to have now straight uh, legs. Even when we are, we know when the child, when a Congolese child is born in Europe, and when from my Congo, when is born in Europe or in the city center, and, uh, and those who are born uh, in uh, back home or in the village, because the grandma will be massaged. Even your school, that's why my, my head is round. When you are born, sometimes your head is uh, flat here. It is uh, because you can be depending on the way you, you came out, but they would put some uh, warm uh, palm oil and they would shape it. every day they would massage gently they would massage that um, that head to give it a bowl shape they would massage also your legs with that uh, warm palm oil because that you only you don't have oil oil so palm oil with everything massage it and they would just straighten your leg the Jews were doing the something similar with swaddling clothes so they would bind the legs of the, uh, the child for months, like, like it worked like a cast, but not too rigid. Uh, and so that the, as the child grows, he has now straight legs, not bow legs or cross legs. But it would massage. So when we became Christian, we read Matthew. And we were, we were already James. And James says, uh, uh, when people are sick, you should anoint the sick. Uh, with oil and the prayer of faith will raise the, the, the dead. Well, we read, instead of anointing, we read massaging. <laughs> so when people were coming to us uh, for, for, heal, for healing, we put some oil on them and we were massaging them. And one day I read that Bible, so it doesn't say massage. But you see, sometimes we preach the gospel with our tradition background. Hallelujah. And God still smiles at us. He said, oh, guys, have you read massage or uh, anoint? But we massage, I, massage, I used to be a masseur. When in, the, in the cell group, I would massage everybody. My hands were hurting. <laughs> I brought the chair, come and massage me. I said, okay, God have mercy on us. But he got healed. He brought his crutches. He come out, come out of the wood, wheelchair, he dropped his crutches. He was walking, but... Uh, with uh, one foot shorter than the other one, he was uh, always little. And we, for us, it was a victory because he did not die, praise the Lord. He did not remain in the wheelchair, praise the Lord. And then eventually he dropped his crutches. If he's at least limping, that's okay. But when my brother had a similar accident, broke his spine on neck, to now I have a better understanding of the word of God. My mom, when uh, he came, we prayed, he came back to his senses, the madness left. My mom said, hallelujah, thank God. I said, no. It is not finished. You don't settle for like there is a perfect wholeness. And he came out of the wheelchair. I must say, praise the Lord. I said, no, it is not finished. It's not going to have crutch. It's not going to limp. And then God made him perfectly whole. That he even went to the naval, uh, uh, the, the, how do you call it, the, the naval officer's uh, school in the Ivory Coast. And he was jogging for three years with all the other naval officers. They did not know that this guy was, my mom was always afraid. Maybe he, he would have said, I said, God has made him perfectly whole. Don't worry about any other thing. Let me jog, let him jog with the other naval officers. We went from glory to glory, from faith to faith. But if I did not know it, thank God for my pastor. 
Or sometimes people, they know the word of God, they stagnate. They don't want to go high. I will not let my brother be in a wheelchair. God forbid. I will not let my brother have crutches. God forbid. There is perfect, the wholeness in Christ, uh, in Jesus. So you either take it or leave it. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 14, verse 34 to verse 36, that as when the people knew that Jesus has come to the, 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 the part of the country, Gennesaret, they brought all the, the sick that they had all around that uh, country. And as they brought them to, to, to Jesus, the Bible says that they just begged him, just let us touch your, the hem of your garment. The Bible says as many as touched the hem of his garment, they were made perfectly whole. There is a perfect wholeness in Christ Jesus. And of course, Acts chapter 3, verse 16, that, that crippled mind that was at the gate beautiful. Uh, Peter said, um, faith uh, in Jesus and the use of the name of Jesus made this man perfectly sound in the presence of you all. So there's perfect soundness of spirit, soul, and body. There's perfect wholeness of spirit, soul, and body in Christ. You don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. God will give you a new brain, a new brain. God would recreate the DNA. That's why sometimes I shut my ears. I don't sit with a lot of people because they all need to talk negative. They don't believe the I believe the Bible. My Bible says God manipulates DNA, and we saw that already. Uh, I think we are going to sit uh, further down. We've heard uh, Jacob, how he, when I read the Bible, I see science there. That's how my father taught me how to read my Bible. <laughs> That's how God wants us to read our Bible. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that is impossible with God. God is the one who does the healing. Without the healing. So he will continue to do the healing, the healing. And when he does the healing, it is going to be an enduring healing. You're not going to lose your healing. Whatever God does is always perfect. David says that the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Hallelujah. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your own hands. That's Psalm 138, verse 8. So the Lord is going to perfect that which concerns you as well, in your health, for your children. Believe the way God wants you to believe in the name of Jesus. So that's uh, uh, what uh, the Bible says on the perfect uh, wholeness and perfect soundness. It is according to the scriptures. From now on, oh, believe, believe. So in the storehouse of heaven, actually, there are body parts. I did not know that scripture, but uh, when I was having my heart uh, condition, when I was uh, 12, uh, when I was finally diagnosed with that heart condition, the deformed heart, I needed um, a heart transplant. I sat there at 12, no, I was 11 going to 12 here. Yeah. I was finishing primary school. I sat there and I uh, looked at uh, the mechanic that used to come and fix our Renault 25. And that day, the pump, uh, the, what do you call it, uh, fuel pump was not working. So he removed it, he bought a new one and fixed it, uh, and then tried it. I used to help him, uh, mechanical, um, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, by trade as well. So, uh, so I'm helping him, uh, he would remove it and so on and so forth. And then I sat there, I said, if the manufacturer of uh, Renault knew that uh, maybe one day the pump is going to be defective and they had the spare part, how much more my Heavenly Father he has spare part? And then in those days, the revival came to our country 
and the people from uh, Zaire at that time that has become DRC Congo, they use uh, to, they used to sing some wonderful Christian songs. We were still uh, Catholics and trying to the, the the revival was entering the country. So most of the songs were coming from uh, Zaire, which is now DRC. Uh, so there was that uh, lady that she was singing a song, and the song was basically saying that the earthly people they created cars. They were themselves in a car crash, a car wreck. They created boats like boats like Titanic. They sank in their own boats. <laughs> and they created aircraft. They crashed in their own aircraft. But God, you created the earth, and uh, the earth uh, spew out. The, the earth could not hold you. Death could not even hold you captive. So if my heart is uh, diseased, you have in your heart there in heaven. So I said, aha, that was a revelation. That's why songs are powerful, if they are truly empowered by uh, the, the Holy Spirit. My dialect is not the dialect of DRC, but I learned that dialect, Lingala, because most of the Christian songs were in that uh, language. So because I like singing, so I had to learn it so that I can sing on to the Lord. So I sang that song um, almost every day because I was believing God for a new heart. And guess what? God gave me a brand new heart. I was praying uh, when I was on the mountain last time. I was praying, and the Lord was speaking to me. And uh, I was watching a documentary. And that documentary, there was a guy in America, uh, black African guy in America. His uh, brother-in-law had a kidney problem, and uh, they said that if uh, we could have a kidney transplant, then uh, uh it would be good so after his uh good heart though he divorced even with from with his wife but uh, he, he was in good terms with his brother-in-law so he decided to give uh, uh his ex-brother-in-law because he had already divorced uh, his wife he gave him now his kidney one of his kidneys because he was compatible so they get put the kidney and uh, 10 years later the guy died so he was very angry I thought if I give him my kidney, he will leave. He will leave. They said, no, even if someone has a kidney transplant, uh, yeah, an already is going to live for seven years with that kidney. The maximum that he can leave with, leave with someone else's kidney is uh, 10 years. But after 10 years, it is useless. Unless someone else gives you his kidney, you are going to die. And then the guy was angry. So you should have told me that I would not have given my, my kidney. Now I only have one kidney. And, uh, and then the Lord said, look at also the heart, had the transplant. So I immediately went on the NS, NHS uh, website. So we need to find out from the doctors themselves. And have, uh, if you have a heart to transplant, they say, oh, on average, if you have a heart to transplant, if it, you, it, it was a good donor, good fit, uh, it is only, um, five years that you are going to have with that heart. The maximum is uh, seven years. And then I sat there and I wept. I said, oh God, thank you. Because it truly did not matter. Even if I came in France, I was on the donor list and they found someone who died and in a car accident and they gave me his heart. I would just have lived the maximum seven years. So from uh, at the age of, uh, let's say, 18, I would have died. Maximum at the age of 18, I would have died. And I was talking to God. <laughs> and God now was explaining to me. He said, you see, behind every organ, there is a spirit. When Adam and Eve was cut off from uh, God's presence and God's spirit, though they covered themselves with fig leaves, but they truly died already. And it was just a matter of time, they were dying, 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 dying. If they take an organ from you, place it in someone else's uh, body, your body has a spirit, the spirit of a man, the spirit of a woman. So your spirit is attached to your body because uh, your spirit has departed from that organ. It is not just a pump or a filter, the kidney or the pump to the heart. It is not just a pump. Your spirit also is uh, 
attached to that organ. And if you are no more, or if it has been cut off from you, the spirit that is the sustaining the organ. That's why when your spirit comes out, all the whole body also stopped working because your spirit checked out of the body. So when they also remove one of the organs, the heart or the kidney, they can stimulate the pumping, but because it is not your spirit that is attached to that organ, it is going to die slowly, just like when mankind was severed from the relationship with uh, God's spirit. They started now to die. Adam and Eve now were dying. That's what the doctors are not understanding. They are pumping people with chemicals so that they do not reject the organ. It did not reject the body, not reject the organ, but it cannot live more, live more than five, uh, seven years for a heart transplant, more than 10 years for a kidney transplant. Because the spirit of the person is no longer there. But when God gives you a brand new heart, because Psalm 139, the Bible says, You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of God's hand, and my soul knows it very well. Uh, so, all your body parts and your organs, they are all already written in. Uh, in heaven, God has uh, um, an inventory. You, you, have a new, you have a new heart in heaven with your name attached to it and your spirit already in it because He created your spirit. When He breathed in Adam and Eve, He put the spirit in Adam and became a living being. Adam was just clay, but God breathed the spirit in him. So the organs that are in heaven have your spirit also attached to it. So if you receive the organ from heaven, it's going to last you as long as you are going to live to live here on earth. You will not have to die after 10 years. I'm so grateful to God that he gave me a brand new heart. That I did not have that heart to transfer because the spirit of that dead man would not have been in his organ and I would have died. No matter what, how much money my parents would have injected or the NHS or the French social system would have done would avail not. So Psalm 139 verse 13 to 14 it says, for you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I, am fear. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of uh, uh, your hands, uh, your works, and my and that uh, my soul knows very well. So, verse thirty nine. So it says, uh, my substance uh, was not, uh, uh, which means my frame was not, or my bones uh, were not, or my skeleton. So the whole skeleton system and all the organs were not hidden uh, from you when uh, uh, it was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Verse 16, your eyes saw my substance, my frame or my bones, so, uh, or my whole skeleton, yet being unformed. And uh, in your book, so you, in the book in heaven that has all your organs, just like when the, you receive your TV, there is a manual and they, they tell you all the organs, uh, all the, the, the the parts of that the TV and how it's supposed to operate. God is a, the God who created your body also has a book of all your organs in heaven. And in the storehouse, those organs, in case one of the earthly one was defected, uh, defective, they have your name and your spirit already attached to it. They are all and all uh, my members so uh, were written. So your 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 arms, your legs, all of them are written in that book. No no organ is missing. And the day fashioned for me. So the, even the number of days that you are going to leave to, to sorry to live on Earth are already also written in that book. This one was created to leave this number of days on Earth. So even before. You were born. God already created all those organs. When as yet there were none of them. So none of them was manifest on earth, but in heaven they already were manifested. 
thank God that uh, he did it already. And it is by faith that we call those things that be not as though they were. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 explains to us that by faith we understand. Uh, but faith comes by here. Faith is the substance of things, so for the evidence of things not seen. So when we have faith, that substance or those frames that Psalm 139 is talking to us, we can bring them on earth as it is in heaven. As those substances, those members, those bones, those frames are in heaven, we can bring them on earth if I miss an organ. And so shall it be. In Jesus' name. God is doing out outrageous uh, miracles. Like I was listening to a uh, boy who was testifying. A lady came, she did not have a womb. Uh, so the her womb was removed. But uh, they prayed and she went, she became pregnant. She has no womb, but she became pregnant. And uh, her husband said to, to, to the man of God, Let, we want to have twins so that we will just have one and uh, that's it. So she went to do the ECG. The doctor said, you are pregnant, but I, I, don't, I don't see the womb, but I see the baby. Uh, she said, no, my past, my daddy said that there are twins. I got to ask God, twins. So she did not believe. She came back uh, next month. They were now twins. So when Ada was uh, seven, she was uh, eight months pregnant. The husband did not want to take any chance that they would have that those babies in Nigeria. So they flew her in the UK. But she came to give birth. She gave birth. They do the they did the, the C-section. They, they brought out the, the twins. So the husband came and uh, asked the, the doctor to to close the womb to say, well, I've never seen that in all my years of practice. There's no womb, but there were twins in it. So when uh, the, 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 the wife uh, woke up uh, from uh, the anesthesia, all the doctors and the nurses were around her. So she thought maybe something has happened. Uh, the child has died uh, at birth. And then they said to her, okay, we just wanted to observe you because nothing like that has ever happened. You have no womb, yet the twins came out of uh, that womb. So shall it be. So we are limiting the, the Holy One of Israel. Who told you because you removed your womb that God cannot? I have a friend, Pastor. He's not a close friend, but he's a pastor friend. He, when he was in DRC Congo, those days it was a year, he was a banker there on the Mobutu. So, and then he fled, came to Europe. Uh, so his wife did not have a womb, according to the doctors. He was a banker, so he had money, he came to France, they did all the tests, they say, your wife doesn't have any womb. So the family ganged up and said that you need to divorce that woman uh, because uh, uh, that's uh, not uh, what we want for our son. We want you to have children. He said, I'm now a Christian, and further, more, I'm now a pastor. How can I divorce? He said, I, all the other pastors, they divorce as well. So don't you want children? God will forgive you. God knows. But if you don't want to even go outside, have and, and pregnant women outside, and then bring, uh, bring, bring them home, and your wife will raise them up, uh, people will understand, because she couldn't give you children. I said, no, adultery. So I said, no, adultery will enter heaven. So they prayed. He fasted and prayed. Today, uh, uh, he's an apostle. Apostle uh, Andre Diba, they have nine children. Nine children. The one that said that the doctor said she had no womb. They confirmed it in France and in Belgium she had no womb. They have nine children. Majority, she only had one boy, but a seven, <laughs> eight, eight girls. They now live in Rochdale, outskirts of Manchester. God is the God of the impossibilities. So don't just uh, accept the report of the doctors that there's no organ there, so we can't do anything. Yes, you can't do anything, but God has organs in heaven. So we want to drive away in our heart the spirit of doubt. We want to divide. Uh, 
the doubt in our heart in the name of uh, Jesus. Now, the Bible says whoever, but that includes you. So whenever you read in the Bible, whoever, whatsoever, these are some few words that Christians don't believe. All of us are qualified to receive God's miracles, all of us. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Just like all of us are qualified to be saved, all of us are qualified to be healed, to be delivered, to be prospered. But we disqualify ourselves. Maybe God doesn't want me to prosper. After all, not everybody's going to prosper. So you are cutting yourself out. I don't believe that everybody is going to be healed. Okay? So you are cutting yourself out. I don't believe that uh, uh, God answers all the prayers. Thank God. You, he answers all my prayers. I believe it. So if you call upon me, I'm going to answer. Don't cut yourself off. If you are double-minded, you're not going to receive anything from receive anything from the Lord. Stop being double-minded. Take the word of God at uh, face value. Don't be like uh, the, the waves of the sea that are being tossed uh, by the wind to and fro. No, today you say, I think God wants me to be healed. I think God wants me to be prosperous. I think, no, he wants it. No, don't think it. It is his will. Don't be double-minded. Don't be unstable in all your ways. You are going to receive nothing if you believe that way. You need to set your face like a flint. Like God said to Jeremiah, set your face like a flint. You need to have a dogged attitude about the promises of God that it will come to pass in my life. God will not pass me by. That was James 1, 6 to 8. Don't be double-minded. It is not going to pay you anything if you are double-minded. Our attitude should be, if something is written at least twice or three times, it is the will of God and it will surely come to pass. We need to settle it in our heart. This is the spiritual principle that was taught to Joseph in Genesis chapter 41, verse 32. Joseph said to Phil that the dream, the reason why God repeated the dream twice, uh, the two dreams will mean the same thing, but they just presented them differently. It is because uh, the thing is established by God and he will, show, he will bring it to pass shortly. Okay? Then God also said to Moses, the same principle in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, okay, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word must be established. So if you find something repeated in the Bible twice or three times, it means it is always the will of God and uh, he wants to do it in your life. And uh, Jesus also from his own mouth in Matthew chapter 18, verse 16, tells us the same principle. Listen, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word must be established. So if you find something repeated twice or three times in the Bible, God always wants to do that. And don't cut yourself off that this is for other people. No. Paul also tells us the same principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. I'm coming to you the third time. So that by mouth of two or three witnesses, every word must be established. It is the will of God. So once you understand the spiritual principle, then uh, find out, is it the will of God for me to be healed? How many blind people does he, has he opened uh, the eyes? Okay, you have blind Bartimaeus. You have uh, those two blind that follow Jesus uh, into his house. You have... Uh, that are the blind person uh, that uh, John chapter 9. Okay, that settles it in my heart. It is the will of God to open my blind eyes. How many lepers has he cleansed? So Naaman, he cleansed Naaman the leper. He cleansed the, uh, the 10 lepers that came to him. He cleansed the leper that came to him at the feet of uh, the mountain when he came down from Mount, the, the, from the sermon on the mountain, Matthew chapter 8. So I have... Uh, for a freak, a free example of a leper, so that's enough. How many cripples did he, uh, did he uh, raise? Well, the Bible tells us, uh, the man at the pool of Bethesda, it tells us of, um, of um, the book of Acts, chapter three, the man at the gate, beautiful. He tells us of uh, the other man that uh, Emmaus, the Lord, uh, Paul said to him, the Lord hears you. So he stood up and walked. And all the other scriptures about lame and maimed, pick up your bed and walk and so on and so forth. 
enough. I believe. I believe he heals all our diseases. That's how, how many dead people did he raise? Well, in the Bible, we have uh, uh, Elijah. Elijah raised that the woman, uh, the son, woman's son. Elisha raised another, the, the son of that uh, uh, Shulamite woman. And then uh, uh, after even he was dead, his born raised that uh, Moabites. What else? The daughter of Jair was raised from the dead. The daughter of Jairus, sorry, was raised from the dead. The, the, the son of that widow in Luke chapter 7 was raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Eutychus was raised from the dead in the book of Acts. Um, Dorcas or Tabitha was raised from the dead in the book of Acts by, 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 by Peter. So it was always the will of God. We have three dead raising in the Old Testament. It's always the will of God to heal, not just in the Old Testament, in the ministry of Jesus. We have three examples. Uh, dead raising in the book of Acts, we have at least two examples. It is always the will of God to raise the dead. Then you see your husband dying there. You so you know it is prematurely. Say no, God, Lord, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away lie from the pit of hell. Satan came to kill, not the Lord take the taketh away. Job said it because he was ignorant. It was Satan that was killing his children. Not God. As we write, God cannot be tempted by evil. In the letter of uh, today. A lot of people have preached the gospel to why they were ignorant of the ways of God. You think the, the reason why it is written is so that we can know what was behind the scene. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, like Paul was saying to Timothy, you need to study to show yourself approved of God, not of man, but of God, uh, workmanship that knows how to rightly divide the word of truth. And people don't know if the thing is coming from the devil or from God, then you are confused. Don't teach anybody that kind of nonsense. When Kelvin died, uh, well, I did not uh, think twice. I know it was the will of God for him to come back to life. He died the present time. I know it was the will of God for him to come to how many times? I don't care how many times. It is always the will of God. It is not his time yet. I'm not for two or three witnesses. Every word must, even that the same verse, it is repeated three times. No, one, two, uh, three, four times. So what do you need? He said it to Joseph. He said it to Moses. He said it to Jesus. He said it to Paul. It is always the will of God. That's the principle that we go by. Is it the will of God to prosper me? While he prospered Abraham, he became very rich. He prospered uh, Isaac, he became very rich. Even the king envied him. Imagine uh, King, Ch king Charles is envious of you because you have a prosper, you become even richer than uh, the whole, whole royal family. That's how uh, Isaac was prosperous. He became a threat to the king Abimelech. Jacob, when he came out of uh, the land after 20 years, he, his personal fortune was 100, is about 100 million US dollars of today. 100 million dollars of today. David was a billionaire. What he gave from his personal treasure, we, we calculated the last time, uh, 100,000 uh, uh, talents of gold and 1 million talents of uh, silver. So we calculated all together, it was about 47 billion US dollars that David gave to the house of God. So if that's what David gave, 47 billion US dollars to the, to the house of God. How much did he leave for, did he leave for his children? It was our children with different wives to settle them. And how much did he leave to Solomon, the one that was the heir to the throne? The personal wealth of Solomon was estimated at uh, 500 tons of gold. They were not even counting silver. For him, silver was a last stone. He used to bring his ship to Tarshish, which is about Spain and, um, and, um, and Wales, to take the gold of Ophir and uh, bring it. He used to have a business of selling horses. He was a businessman. He was not from... Uh, 
the tax of the, of the country that Solomon made his money. He was a businessman. When people came to consulting, he was the first one that was uh, being paid for consultancy. They would consult his wisdom and they would pay him for that uh, consultancy fees. How he made his wealth. God is going to the power to get to wealth. If it was just by the tax of the country, it would not be as rich as uh, the other kings. But God gave him a uh, power to get what he would send ships all over the place he would buy timber that was rare in the in uh, israel and in the surrounding uh, countries he would buy spices the queen of sheba would bring him so much spices and he would sell it he was doing the trade business but it was not the church money that solomon uh, became a rich uh, so the personal wealth of solomon is estimated at uh, 3.2 trillion uh, you was a you a pound sorry 3.2 trillion is it the will of god for you to prosper yes but you will prosper you so that you can become a source of blessing that's what many christians do not understand so if you don't want that's, that's fine but uh, don't preach to people god wants you to be poor blessed at the point you see, blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning they are humble, they, they depend on God, they know that without God, you, they can do nothing. They owe everything to God. That's what poor in spirit means. So when you see something repeated three times, because if you don't renew your mind, if we don't renew our mind according to the word of God, then we are going to limit what the Holy One of Israel can do for us, because He can only do exceedingly and abundantly above what we ask. And above all, we think if we can mute our minds, that will be good according to the power that is at work in us. Now, now healing, healing is not based on our good uh, deeds. Are we supposed to do good deeds? Yes. Are we supposed to live right? Yes. But we need to base our healing, our healing on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Without it, none of the fasting that we do, none of the praying that we do, none of the living right that we do will avail to anything. We need to acknowledge where the healing is coming from. The work of Jesus on the cross. Do we give tithe? Yes. Do we? All those things we do. But these are not the things that commend us to God. First and foremost, it is uh, the sacrifice of his son. Even if God works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. But the truth is, if there were no sacrifice of Christ Jesus, there was uh, no access even to the presence of God, no access to all those promises of God. So we should settle it in our heart and learn to give all the glory to Jesus. So, Jesus tells us, in, for instance, in Luke chapter uh, 18, from 9 to 14, that two people went into the temple to pray. That's we need to be very careful the way we are praying as well. One was a tax collector. Uh, so for them, tax collector were thieves. The other one was a um, uh, Pharisee. So he used to fast twice a week. He used to pray. Do we do that? Yes. Do we pray with fast? Yes. Do we live right? Yes. But we don't present those works to God. We know that even our fasting, God is the one working not both to will and to do for his good pleasure. If we don't learn to ascribe the power, the glory, the righteousness unto God, then we are going to limit to what he can do for us. The, the publicans was, uh, or the publican or tax collector was, uh, standing behind and he was uh, beating his chest to say have mercy on me a sinful person okay and god had mercy on him he went back home justified the other one where well, uh he was uh, beating his chest you know for me i fasted twice a week i'm not like uh, stop comparing yourself with other people it is not wise it's as if uh, uh a 20 year old is comparing himself with a two year old. No, there will be people are going to expect more. If you see, for instance, a 20 year old that is uh, uh, rolling on the floor, 
uh, walking barefooted, uh, not bathed. You see, something is wrong with him. Either he's mentally retarded because he's not supposed to be rolling on the floor with, like the toddlers. He's supposed to stand, behave. You see him in the church uh, walking uh, underneath the pews. You say, what, what's wrong with you, boy? Come on, behave yourself. Because uh, you expect more of him. So he cannot compare. That's why even with, with, between Christians, what God will expect of Moses is not what he expected of uh, the people. What was the sin? To Moses was not sent to the, the, the people. What was sent to, um, how do you call him, uh, Samuel was not sent to the people. Because God, to whom much is given, much is going to be expected. So if you now you compare yourself, me already fasted twice a week. Yes, because God is expecting you to do more. You are mature. And this one is a baby Christian. He's struggling with this and that. So don't compare yourself. And God is going to continue to expect more from you, just like we expect more for our, from our leaders, not just uh, intellectually, but also morally. They are moral. Uh, they have uh, a moral uh, obligation to also behave in, as role models, as leaders. So we expect more from them. But today we no longer expect anything from our leaders. So, so who cares? The way they leave, they are not even role models at all. But truly, comparing yourselves, your, yourselves with others is not wise. Peter is looking back and saying, what are you saying about John? Why just me following you everywhere? What is that to you? You have a different destiny. I'm going to put this kingdom up on your shoulders. You're going to be a pillar. Of, of all the apostles, you're going to be the main pillar. I'm asking more of you. I'm trying to teach you, and, uh, and then you are going to strengthen your brethren. When Jesus said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you, the word there is uh, you in plural, uh, all of you. But I have prayed for you. The word is thou, uh, uh, for, sorry, uh, for D, is D. Uh, so only you in, you in singular. But unfortunately, the English has messed it up now, the modern English. But in French, it is still there with le vous, uh, vous and uh, le tu. So I've only prayed for you, Peter. I'm not bothered even about praying for all of the, all the other 11. I'm only praying for you. Because I know you are like uh, the... How can I... Uh, you want to have dominoes. When the first domino falls, all the other ones are going to fall. So that's why I'm focusing on you. If you can stand... All your brethren behind you are going to stand. So I'm, I'm praying for you alone, Peter. So that when you are strengthened, you are going to strengthen also. When you are restored into the faith, you are going to strengthen all your brethren. That's why for one person, the whole family of the earth is blessed. I want to talk to you, Abraham. I want to constrain your life because your life is going to be the pattern for the life of all of those who would have a faith, they are going to walk in your footsteps. You are going to be the prototype of what a righteous person is supposed to be. And he made some mistakes, say, yes, but okay, uh, Ishmael, get rid of him. That's not the plan, but you have, have to constrain your life. That's why the high priest also, God had to constrain the life of the high priest. God had to tell the high priest, you don't marry this, you don't marry this, you don't marry this. Uh, so what is my marriage? They say, yes, your marriage, yes. But you are also going to be the prototype of all the marriages on, uh, in the land of Israel. So that's why I'm telling you, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Even if you become a widow, well, I'm free now to marry. You no, know, a widower. I'm free to say, yeah. But even when you become a widower, you cannot marry this, you cannot marry this. You only can marry this group of people, this group of people. God even has to say something about your marriage. Because God now will constrain you, is require even more of you. And if you do not understand it, and you start comparing yourself with other people, you know, run your race. Even if God requires more of you, because uh, He's going to do more also through you. So it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that uh, brought the healing package to all of us as in Jesus' precious name. So, let us give all the glory 
to God. Peter says in First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, by his stripes, we were here. Not by Jerry's stripes or any pastor's stripes. Nobody died on the cross for you except one person. Even if they died on the cross, there were other thieves that were crucified with Jesus. The blood and the sacrifice was worth nothing because they were born in sin. Only one was sinless. His name is in Jesus. Only one could be acceptable as a sacrifice for your sins and my sins. His name is uh, Jesus. So remember, always remember that uh, your healing, your healing was purchased through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. And choose to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And God is going to give you all those blessings. He is going to anoint your head with oil. And you are going to uh, want to nothing. So everything is based on the finished uh, work of Jesus. Your forgiveness is based on the finished work of Jesus. It is all based on his mercy. He did it all. That's why we are always grateful. Always grateful. Every time you read the Bible, you will always see someone crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you have that heart disposition that you always ascribe everything to God, your holiness, not because you are better than others, but no, God has given you the strength to walk in holiness and to practice righteousness. So ascribe the holiness unto your maker, the Bible. Ascribe the righteousness to your creator. Ascribe the power to your God. We are going to address it in the application. It is all about Jesus, all about him. And none of us, though we participate, we, we yield. The only credit that we have is that we yielded to the Holy Spirit. We were willing to be made willing and uh, thank God for that. But all the other glory goes back to him. Son of David, have mercy on me. And he turned and touched the eyes of those blind, uh, uh, those blind people and they were healed. The eyes were opened according to Matthew 9, verse 27 to verse 31. It is about his mercy, not because we were better than uh, any other person. So the other thing is that you need to believe in your heart that God wants to make everybody perfectly whole and perfectly sound. Not just my brother who fell down from the second story of the building, but what he does for one. The book of Mark chapter 13, the last verse says, what I say to one, I say to all. That's how you need to see the Bible. Everything that is there is saying that to you. I thank God for my parents because that's how they brought us up. We were three boys. They used to call us the Daltons. The Daltons are four brothers. And the, the youngest is the tallest. The, the eldest is the shortest. But they always they were always prisoners. It's in the Lucky, Lucky, Lucky Luke uh, cartoon. So they would always wear the same, uh, uh, because they always were in prison, so they would wear the same uh, prison outfits. But my parents did not want us to believe that they loved one child above the other uh, or the others. So whenever my mom would travel to Europe, she would buy us, uh, in, the, in the beginning, she used to buy us the same thing, the same color, but just different size because we were, I was the tallest, I was my elder brother the shortest. So we were just like the Dalphins. <laughs> so we were three instead of four. Uh, so we have the same clothes, the same, the same, uh, the same color, but different size of shirt. The same trouser, uh, same color, but different size. The same shoes, same color, but different size. So for me to believe that uh, what God does for Paul, He wants to do that for me is easy because that's how I was brought up. My parents did not discriminate that they would give more to my elder brother and. Uh, uh, less to me, never. And then until I think when we were about uh, 14, my elder was 14 and uh, I was uh, 11. So we said enough. We don't want to look like the Daltons anymore. Everybody in the neighborhood, in the suburb calls us the Dalton because we always dress uh, with the same house as if we were, we were triplets. <laughs> I said, no, enough. So you buy the same number of uh, clothing, the same number of shoes, uh, the same number of trousers, uh, shirts and t-shirts, but different colors, different colors, <laughs> okay, okay. So now when they went, they would travel, they would buy the same number. If I have two tr trousers, they would have two trousers as well each. Two shirts, they would have two shirts each, but different colors. 
Full stop. So I understand that God is no respecter of person. The way he treats one son, he treats everyone. Thank God for my parents because uh, in some families, they don't understand the Bible. You need to treat everybody the same. Read Perfect Redemption Plan 1. We address the adoption. When God adopts you, when you adopted the, the Greek law, when you adopted, the Jews never adopted the children. Because God promised them to have their own children. No need a shall be barren or suffer miscarriage. That's what he has promised us as well. We have the same Bible. And, uh, but the Gentiles were adopting. And the, the Greek law is when you adopted a son or a daughter, you gave him the same inheritance that you gave to your biological son. Your begotten son. That's why Jesus can say to us, works that I do, you will do them. Greater works than this you are going to do. Because Father loves you the same way he loves me, as I've explained already in Prophet Redemption Plan 1. All those things they build up. So when people just jump into Prophet Redemption Plan 5 because they want to know about healing, about healing, but the heart, they don't believe the same way. And they have a problem. They wonder why they are not having the same result. Because it is from what is in your heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is it. You uh, believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. And you're going to be saved. Some people are confessing the right thing, but they are believing the wrong thing. They are repeating something like a parrot, but they don't believe in it in the heart. Or they are believing wrongly. That's why it is not working. So, Believe that God wants to make everybody whole and everybody sound in the name of Jesus. So I've shared this testimony here of the Lord asking me to go to one of the hospitals in Manchester, uh, outskirts of Manchester, uh, with and show hospital in Manchester. And they wanted me to cause, cause me to hear the word of the Lord. So when I got there, uh, People were not, um, I did not see anybody, okay? So I thought I did not hear from the Lord. And then after an hour, I took the bus and I rode back to to, to the city center where I was. Uh, it was an one hour and a half uh, from the, uh, from Withan Shore to Piccadilly. I had time. So there were two nurses behind me talking the mother tongue and were criticizing uh, Harshly, one of their own colleagues uh, that uh, had uh, to give birth to two children, uh, but uh, they were the, the, the two of them were dwarf uh, children. So because of that, the husband abandoned her, and uh, so they were making fun. She's a beautiful sister, so they were making fun. They were jealous. They were making fun of her. Ha ha! This is the kind of children she's giving birth to. So it became a reproach to that sister. And I was the heart broken, and the Lord said to me, that's what I wanted you to hear. Many men are so irresponsible. They will have a child with a, a woman, and then when the child is born with a problem, medical problem, they just bail out uh, on that woman. They abandon her, and that woman even feels bad. And maybe it was her uh, own fault that the child was born this way, that way. So it is not just barrenness that is a reproach to women. Uh, in the book of uh, Genesis uh, 30, uh, from 22 to 23, the barrenness is uh, mentioned there as a, a reproach. And when uh, uh, she gave birth, uh, Jacob's uh, Sarah, uh, no, sorry, Rachel, the wife of Jacob, gave birth. She said that the Lord has removed my uh, reproach in the name of Jesus. So it is not just barrenness that is uh, now a reproach. Elizabeth as well, she mentioned that barrenness was a reproach. Uh, the truth is many people, the truth is we should go back by the Bible. The feminist movement, the feminist movement lied to women. And that's truly from the pit of hell that, oh, you don't need to marry at all. You don't need anyone. You don't need someone to control your life. Marriage is not to control the life of anybody. You don't want to be submissive to anyone. Well, uh, submission the way the Bible says it is not the way the pagan understand it. So we need to do that Bible way. We submit also to one another. So the feminists, they were so against marriage, so against the family. You don't need to raise a family. And unfortunately, some Christians have that view. 
or I don't want to have a family. What Bible are you reading? So, but what tends to happen, and we need to say it, because some people may be angry, but we need to say it. And because they will regret it later on, but there's nobody, because nobody told them when they were much younger. And then they run after a career, they want to be aggressive and so on and so forth. Okay, be aggressive as you want. God created women. We are going to see that uh, uh, through the Bible studies. I think um, treasure, seek a, a buried treasure. A woman is not just, uh, according to God's word, it's not just uh, a man with a womb. No. There's a different uh, name that God gives to women. And there's a different way that we raise women than we raise the men. Because God sees the uniqueness of women, the uniqueness of men. They are equal, but uh, they are different and they are unique. And it is beautiful. Now, when you want women to act like men and men to act like women, then we are in trouble. So the feminist movement deceived the women. And they went for what was not uh, the desires of the hearts. We succeeded in every aspect of life. God also wanted to succeed. And then they did not have a family. They did not have children. And then they started now to regret. Oh, I wish I was, uh, uh, I did things differently and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's now too late. And it becomes a reproach that, oh, I don't have children. Even if they say, no, it doesn't matter, but deep inside them, they say, ah, I wish I had my own children. And then they go in there and I don't thank God, there are many children to adopt a praise the Lord for that. But we need to be able to speak the truth. It would anger some people, but if they never heard that when they were much younger and they were listening to those feminist uh, movement and nonsense, they are all miserable, those feminists. They are all miserable. I've not seen the happy uh, feminists. They're all miserable. Because that's not the way God created us. We want us to have, to have a family, to enjoy life. And Paul says, if you are not married so and you want to marry, so go remarry. Even at the 70, go remarry. If you want to, 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 to remarry, go remarry. Have someone in your life in Jesus' name. Instead of uh, being a busy body, in, uh, the, what tends to happen, I think we've addressed that in one of those, uh, my weekly milk. Women that uh, abandon their own husband, they tend to be busy bodies in other people's marriages and destroy, making sure to destroy other people's uh, Marriage, Paul said them in Thessalonians, shut up, mind your own business and stop destroying other people's house because your own house, you destroyed it. And you're trying to say that you don't need a husband, you don't need a family. Uh, no, the truth is you are jealous and envious and you are making sure that your friends are also around you, you are destroying the marriages. And when they have destroyed the marriage, they were after five years, they're going to regret. Oh, I had my marriage, it was not perfect, but uh, why did I listen to the, my friends? Too late. So, we need to reemphasize uh, that family is very important. There's a need in our heart for family. Not everybody is created to remain alone. That's not, not everybody. Like Jesus said to Peter, said Jesus, then but then she's better not to marry. Say no, not everybody has that gift. It's a gift from God to be able to remain alone. It's a gift from God. Not everybody has that gift. So if you don't have that grace, we marry in the Lord in the name of Jesus. So barrenness used to be a reproach, and it is still a reproach today. Even if we try to lie about it, the truth is some people have a lot of regrets in the heart, a lot of regrets. So may we not uh, regret, may we learn when there is still time and may we speak to our children, to our sons and daughters, so that we will get away from that feminist 
movement thing. Now it is the LGBT nonsense that is uh, coming to the church also. So let us be aware of those things uh, in the name of Jesus. If you want a family, so go for a family in the name of Jesus. So a lot of things have become uh, our reproach, especially sickness. They would always blame the wife. I don't know why they blame the husband. They would always blame the wife. You know, it, she's giving me children who are crippled. She's giving me children that are, that are, that are mute. Who says it is always coming from the woman? It may be coming from the man, but nobody blames the man. But God wants to do something new in the name of Jesus. He wants to heal all those uh, who are sick, all those who have the report, be they are dwarf or they are uh, uh, whatever sickness, whatever disease. He wants to heal them, all of them. And my prayer is that we are going to believe it in our heart. That God wants to make all of them whole and pray for the people in the mighty name of Jesus. So I share some testimonies and prophetic action. So you can read uh, that, that prophetic action in the name of Jesus. But what I want you to believe in your heart is that the God heals them all in the name of Jesus. And uh, you will do the same thing uh, in the name of So these are personal uh, testimonies. So listen to them or read them uh, in the name of Jesus. But believe whatever reproach that is in your life, God wants to turn that reproach around. Remove it completely from your life and your family. And make it. I went, oh, I've seen things. The devil is wicked. My friend, uh, Ken Trench, he has a, a church in Barhead. And uh, though, there, there's a couple, they are married. They are married, wonderful Christians. White people also have some genetic uh, disorder that only white people have. Black people also have some genetic disorders that only black people have. Indian also have one genetic disorder that only Indian have. Um, so the, when the husband comes to church, the wife stays at home. When the wife comes to church, the husband stays at home. Or the grandma, if they, the two of them come, come to church, it is the grandmother that will stay at home with the children. I did not know why they were never bringing the children. But though that day, the children were sick. They were having some high temperature, and it was not coming down for, for, for a week. So the pastor said, do, do you want to, to come? Uh, to my house, to the house of my church members, we want to pray for them. I said, okay, okay, that's no problem. I always go for a church home visit. I said, don't stare. I said, well, I said I'm just, I'm just telling you, do you don't stare, don't stare. Uh, I said, okay, I just, there are, there's just a problem with the children, but don't stare. I said, okay, that's fine. So we went somewhere in Paisley and uh, we entered the house. Do he said to me, don't stare. I did not stare, but my heart broke within me. Oh, you need to, to have compassion. My heart broke within me. The, they have, um, the doctor said, and you should not marry because the two of you have uh, that uh, gene in you. So most of the children that are going to have, uh, they are going to have uh, that disorder. But they say, no, the Lord uh, told us to marry. <laughs> so they went ahead and got married. They were pregnant. They said to them, the children have, the child has uh, that, uh, that gene. So don't, uh, you need to abort. They say, we are Christians. We don't, uh, we, we cannot abort. And they had the first child, the church child had that, uh, uh, that, um, disorder now manifest not as a gene only but manifested as well they went for a second child and the second child also had uh, the same thing and uh, they did not want to abort because they are christians they gave birth so they were at the end of the time i met them they were three the last one was a baby still they were five no seven uh five and then uh, a two-year-old uh, that they had and uh, they literally look like uh, the face, look like rats. 
the devil is wicked. So that's why those children never come out of the house. Imagine you are seven years old, and that was 2014, then 2022. They never come out of the house because people are going to be scared. I, well, before I was saved, I used to watch uh, that uh, movie of Harry Potter. There is a witch in Harry Potter that teaches um, in that Harry Potter school for the more assassins, if I remember his name. And he has a face, face like that, like of a very real monster. And that was how the face of those children were. I said, the devil, you are so wicked. I said, I'm, I'm going to come back for you, Satan. And God is going to kill those children in the name of There are things that I've seen. I've seen. That's why I'm angry with the devil. I remember I was watching the A.A. Allen uh, crusade. There was a child that he had a, a black child who had a disorder. They call it a, a monkey disease. So your face basically will look like that of a monkey. And you could see that in the video. And A.A. Allen prayed for that baby. And uh, the Lord recreated the face of the baby. And uh, everything was made uh, whole in that uh, the baby now could walk. He was not working. He walked for the first time and God did wonderful miracles. That uh, monkey uh, genetic disorder completely disappeared. The devil is wicked. But we serve a good God. That's why we need to go after the healing because lots of families are suffering. We cannot say to women, you shall not abort because it is a murder and no murderer will enter heaven. Yes, but the doctor said that the child is going to be born paralyzed. The doctor said that they don't see legs in the child. They don't see uh, a digestive system in the child. They don't see bones uh, in the child. That's why they want to abort uh, the child. And we said, okay, just give birth to the child and God will take care. Yeah. And then the child is born and there's a problem. That's why we need now the power. In Mexico, there's a wonderful uh, preacher that is there. I don't know what he's doing these days, but uh, in those days, in the 90s, it was still wonderful. And uh, for, uh, one of the lady gave birth they call the child uh, jelly because the child did not have any bone, any bone at all. It was only a part of the skeleton uh, of the rib cage so that the lungs would not collapse on themselves. Uh, so there was uh, the rib cage, but uh, there was no bone from uh, the leg, uh, from the hip down uh, to, the, to the feet. Uh, and then there was no also bone inside the yeah. So they were, you had the, the skin, and that's why that's why they called the, the baby gelito because it was like a jelly, no bone anywhere, just some cartilage here, but no bone at all. So the people got saved, praised the Lord, and they prayed for them. And uh, what God did, God recreated the whole skeleton from head to the toe. All the bones were recreated. And the doctors there in Latin America documented it. People have real problems. When I went to work into the uh, nursing home somewhere in Paisley, there, there are some children that they don't come out because they were born without legs and without arms. And one of them, I was uh, giving a bath. Uh, she was not 21, 20, 20. She was mute. She had a problem with her brain also. And uh, she had no arms, no legs. And the parent refused to abort contrary to the medical report. And she was there and many others, some white children, some Indian children. One of those, the Indian guy that was there also, he was a two, uh, almost 30. He had no legs and no arm, only one arm. We are going to see that. Uh, we need more than empty words in the gospel. People have a real problem. 
and God, it's not that like God doesn't have a power. God has power, but he wants to channel his power through us in the name of Jesus. So it is time for us to wake up and do the right thing in the name of Jesus. You need to believe also that with long life, the Lord is going to satisfy you. The Bible says uh, the, the, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Lord came so that you may have life and have it uh, more abundantly to the full until it overflows uh, in the name of Jesus. If you believe that you have, you have a short life, uh, then that's what is going to happen to you. The numbers of your days, the Lord is going to fulfill it. That's what uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 25 to 26 says. God is going to fulfill the number of your days. You're not going to die prematurely, in other words. You're going to multiply and to be fruitful according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. So in your heart, many people, they fear death. They think about death, 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 death every day. And sickness and weakness, the Bible tells us that uh, none in the midst were feeble. You're being frailed, walking with a, a stick. That's not the plan of God for your life. When God gives you long life, it is long life in good health. That Psalm 105, verse 37, verse 38, which is also in our letter. None in our midst were feeble. He fed them in the wilderness. There was no feeble people. So don't think I'm going to have arthritis. I'm going to have uh, uh, osteoporosis. None in the midst were feeble. So the long life that the Lord is giving unto it is uh, arthritis free. It is uh, uh, rheumatism free. It is uh, what else, uh, whatever disease that is making you feeble. Moses was 120 and his eyesight was not a deal. So I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. That's what John tells us in his third epistle, chapter 1, verse 2. God wants you well in divine health. So when people are going to say, God said to us in Psalm 91, the summer of protection because we came under his wings. He guarantees one of the obligations that he has towards us is to satisfy us with long life and show us his salvation, his healing, his deliverance, his healing, his deliverance. That's verse 16 of Psalm 91. So believe that he's going to do that. It is not that with short life that is going to satisfy. It is with long life is going to satisfy. It is going to fulfill the number of your days. So say it to yourself and believe it in your heart. That's why there are some things that we need to uproot in your heart. So when, for instance, people uh, uh, read, uh, God said, for instance, to us that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, that the number of days of a person are going to be 120. Some people don't want to leave 120 uh, okay, by, uh, by 100, by 90. That's their own choice. But the numbers of your days, God said, it shall be 120. So live in such a way that you are going to take. That's why also God asked them to take good care of the body. It is not just a spiritual thing. If you abuse your body, you are going to go very soon in the grave. Very, very soon in the grave if you abuse your body. So that's why God gave you even the book of Leviticus. I want you to know how to eat, eat properly. Uh, don't uh, drink this, don't drink that, don't eat this, don't eat that, because you want they, they want them also to live, to live long. So we need to do the spirit, soul, and the body. We need to take also care of this uh, body in the name of Jesus. You will satisfy your mouth with good things and renew your youth like even like that of the eagles. According to Psalm 103, verse 3 and 5. So when now people they get into the 70s, they start to have fear because they read Psalm 90 that uh, Moses said, okay, by reason of strength, uh, you are going to have 70 or maximum 85. That's it. But those people in Psalm 90, they were under a curse. Because they disobeyed the Lord from entering the, because the Lord told them to go possess the land and they disobeyed. So the Lord put a cap over their life. 
so that they can die and then a new generation can enter the promised land. But God has not said that for you. So Psalm 91, Psalm 91 is for those of us, the new generation of Deuteronomy that are going to enter into the promised land. Those of us who have not been cursed because of disobedience. And it is with long life that the Lord will satisfy you. So if you believe wrong, you are going to have a, a wrong understanding. Now, let me, so I will stop it here. First, uh, that's uh, chapter 14, uh, our healing is uh, a done deal. So I will stop here. And I want to explain something yesterday that uh, I explained to Sister um, Lulu. And I pray that we are all going to understand it. We go from uh, faith to faith and uh, from grace to grace. So let me explain to you lately what uh, the better, I think I, I understand my brother also understands it, uh, but I might pray that you are going to understand it as well. I explained that to Lulu uh, with another example so that we all can have the same uh, uh, understanding in the name of uh, Jesus. So now, uh, yeah, so think of it this way. Uh, where is it? Where? Um, okay, yeah, no. okay. So you have uh, uh uh, let me take into something else. What am I doing? Okay, let me do this. Okay, and then uh, Okay. okay, so roughly that's uh, okay, now, uh If, for instance, you we, we can take an example of a child, a child that is, uh, let's say, five year old. I will take an example of a child that is five year old. Uh, yesterday, you you need to, to have in in Africa we have uh, you need to go and take your own uh, fetch your own water uh, from uh, you have a bucket and you go fetch your own water from the well okay that's fine a five-year-old if you ask him to go take uh, fetch uh, let's say uh, uh, one one he can carry one liter of water two liters of water but now if you ask him to carry maybe five liters of water that one is going to be too too hard for him to carry five uh, five liter of uh, water, why is it not a drawing? Okay. It is harder for a child to carry five uh, liter of uh, water. Okay, let me use then this other one then. 
it is hard for him to use uh, to fetch five uh, liters uh, of water. But if it is uh, a 12 year old, it is easy for him to fetch uh, five uh, liters uh, of, uh, of water from the well of the, that is in, uh, inside uh, the compound uh, of uh, the family. Or the other example, the, the reason why is because the child has been fed properly. He has developed uh, muscles, so he can actually uh, lift heavy, uh, heavy things because he has grown. But you cannot expect the same thing from uh, a five-year-old. And as you grow, uh, as you grow in uh, in age and you develop also properly then you are able to lift heavier things in the name of Jesus. So because your muscles have been developed, we also spiritually develop our muscles. And we can, uh, God is able now to do greater miracles through us because we are able to lift greater things so if you have this graph imagine we on the first this is a, your, your your own strength so if we take this first a, a curve this one is on this axis you have the miracles let's say uh, headache uh, diabetes and all the other things they fall from uh, this range from zero here, here you have zero miracles. And this is uh, the word of God that you preach, the ministration that you have. And this is uh, uh, the faith of the people. This is the faith of the people. After you are, they have reached, heard your, your word, uh, they have this faith, for instance. Uh, now, let's say this one is eyesight the blinds and you yourself, that's you developing spiritually, spirit, spiritual muscles. This is actually a curve of a material that is being put in traction, that is being stretched. So that the strength of the material is going to change if it reaches uh, this part. When it reaches uh, here, the, it never goes back to zero. When also you build, you go to the gym, you build your muscles. When you reach here, you actually are tearing your muscles. Your muscles are not going to, that's why you have burns when you go to the gym, because you are tearing your muscles. You are going beyond, the, you are entering that, that plasticity domain. So when now you're, you are going to rest, your muscles are going to become bigger. They are going to be here. They are no longer going to be at the zero. So which means, so if you have developed your muscles properly, before to heal someone of a headache, which is a here, for instance, headache, which is X1, you need to preach to people and they build up their faith. So you are preaching to them to build up their faith to reach that level so that they, God can perform the miracle of headache, for instance. But now, because you personally, have built up your faith to this domain. So you already have uh, like uh, in sport, they would call it uh, um, in volleyball or handball, in basketball, they would call it a vertical jump. Your vertical jump is already here. So whether they have zero faith or not, you can pray for them and they receive the healing. This is 100% on you. God even does not need to pour out, it is in you. That's what Peter could say, such as I have, I have it in me. This is my vertical jump, like in sport. I don't need to warm up. I don't need to sing hallelujahs. You wake me up in the morning, I cast out that demon. You wake me up at midnight, I cast out. I don't need to be prayed up. I have it in me. I have developed my faith in such a way that even if you have a zero faith, I have it. So that's why sometimes you see some people, they would have 100% of a healing of uh, deaf ears. 
they have developed the personal faith and the people, whether they have it, they have that faith or they don't have, truly, they are going to have that healing, that healing here. But if I've not developed my faith, I need to preach to people to build. That's why we preach also. It, what, what, what we are doing by preaching is by to build up uh, the faith of the people so that it would reach that level through the preaching and then they can receive uh, this uh, miracle that is uh, here. Or other words that Christians are going to use that these miracles are permanent in him, that gift is permanent in him. So meaning just this build up the faith to this level, that personal faith. So when people were coming to Wiggers Worth, what that were crippled, and they would ask him, oh, I don't have any faith. You say, I have enough faith for the two of us. Like I was explaining to Lulu yesterday, people receive the healings in three ways. Uh, one, uh, it is their own faith that heals them. So you preach to them, you preach to them, and then they have the faith already, and they receive their own healing. That Jesus says, uh, your faith has made you whole. So you heard what I, I, I preached and you believed it. Your faith has made you whole. The problem that we are having is that a lot of people have zero faith. That's why God sends in the book of James, he sends the elders to pray for the new converts. And the elders are supposed to pray the prayer of faith. The, it is the elders that are supposed to have the faith on behalf of of the one who is sick, so that as they pray for them, they are healed. The other way we receive a healing is that we share the burden. If the two of you shall agree on earth as touching, concerning anything, is going to be done by my Father who is in heaven. So imagine I am on this, uh, I've built up my own personal faith. So uh, my own personal faith is, uh, this is my name, I've built up my own personal faith, I've reached uh, this uh, second part of the curve, I'm now here. So if you come, for instance, for, I'm here, for instance, and uh, you want uh, a miracle, let's say uh, cancer. Cancer is, like, let's say, cancer is here, okay? Your faith, I'm not asking you to have more faith, okay? Because if I'm depending only solely on your faith, I'm only depending on your faith, then it means that I, I need you to have a faith up to here. If I'm only depending on your faith and then you are, I will preach to you until you believe, you make the confession for you to have that, the, the cancer healing. So I need, I need to build up your faith uh, up to here so that you can receive uh, this uh, cancer healing. But if I've already built up my own faith, my spiritual muscles, I'm already here. So even with your, the little faith that you have, you only do the 20%, it is enough. The two of us agree. You have your little faith. You don't have to have all this faith here and listen to all my preaching. The little that you heard is enough because I have some uh, already built up faith in me. And then uh, this one is going to come here I'm on this other curve, and we are here already. So your cancer that you want to be to have here is already included. I have enough faith for your cancer. The two of us agree. Now, if for instance you were looking for uh, how do you call it, uh, leukemia or whatever, and leukemia is here, and I'm banking on leukemia. Let's say. Uh, uh, new organs, amputated leg, uh, sorry, new organs, uh, barrenness, and it is here. HIV, it is here. And I'm banking solely on your faith. You mean that I need to preach to you up to here? Actually, your faith is built up uh, here for you to receive uh, that uh, healing of that leukemia and so on and so forth. But if me, the man of God, or the elders, I have stretched my faith already and built it up. I've uh, stretched my muscles, built spiritual muscles, gone beyond this one. I'm here actually spiritually. That's where my, my faith is. 
So the leukemia that you are looking for are more than able, even if you have a zero faith. I can pray for you. I say, I don't even need your faith. I have enough faith for the two of us. We heal the leukemia in Jesus' name. And you are healed of leukemia because even with zero faith at all on your behalf, when people are dead, the dead will never have any faith. So you need to have all the faith yourself to raise the dead because he will never agree with his dead. So if, for instance, we want to share, but I'm built up up to here, okay, and we are looking for, what say, uh, God to recreate a womb, God to recreate, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, an uh, eye that was removed or any other organ that was removed and that the heal, that the organ is here, a new liver, a new heart, okay, and have uh, some faith. The guy also, he puts his own faith. He reaches here. We are sharing the faith. The two of us agree. I'm already here in my curve. So we can have the, that new organ for him. If he increases his faith also, he develops his own faith. Okay, praise the Lord. And I don't need him to do, do much because already when we is here, we can have something that will come up to here close enough. So that's why God spends more time developing the man of God, stretching the man of God or the woman of God, that he has enough, uh, what do we call in uh, basketball or, um, or handball or volleyball, he had enough uh, vertical jump that is here. That whether the people have faith or no faith, there are already some miracles that he can perform on his own uh, faith. Peter will say to that guy, I will get beautiful. I have it in me. Such as I have, I give it on to you. I have it. You don't. The guy was expecting money. Peter gave him a healing from his lameness. People like, uh, for instance, um, William Branham, that is now late, though he did mistakes at the end, God gave him a, a free, uh, two, two main gifts, the word of knowledge to know the secrets of people's heart. Why was he doing that? He was doing that so that he can already move the people here. It is easy for them to receive with only the little faith of the people. He will leave the they, they can already have all the miracles that are within this range those small demons that are here they already can have it so you, that's why you would give them oh, no, your name is this one so what he's doing is he's uh, already stretching his own faith so that the people don't have to start at zero or to stretch themselves too much and uh, you, you also had uh, 100 percent of uh, blind eyes and deaf ears so you had almost two uh, permanent uh, other miracles. So he was uh, here. So he would give some word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and then uh, he would pray immediately for the deaf, for the blind, and they would uh, hear and so, so some cancer, they would be healed in front of everybody. What happened? The faith of everybody has already been uh, uh, raised. So even if you have the zero faith, at least you would receive your blindness, you will receive your cancer, you will receive everything that is in this range. Those small demons that are here, you are going to receive them already. And if now you, there were some stronger things in your life that wanted uh, healing, even if you only have a small faith, it was easy for you to receive it. It would have, uh, if you were banking on your own faith and the guy did not have uh, his own personal faith, the minister of God developed already, you should be here. You should have developed your own personal faith and they should have preached to you for so long before you can reach a miracle that is here. So that's why God spends time training and developing the man of God to have his own faith built up already here so that other people can get already the miracles by his own, by the faith of the minister. So that now 
when we are looking for amputated the arms, amputated the length. Because if you bank on the faith of the people themselves, they cannot reach higher enough. And you need to preach for them to, to them for hours and hours. You only have some time, one hour or half an hour to preach to them. And those who are dead, well, there is no preaching to do to them. So you need to develop your own uh, faith. Have 100% of the faith yourself. So when you observe some ministry, that's why they would always pray for some cases in public. Because they, what they are doing is they are trying to bring the people up to here. So that is easy for people. When now they would they say, okay, you've seen five miracles that God has performed. Okay, now we are going to pray a general prayer. We don't need to lay hands on anyone. We are going to pray now a general prayer. Amen. And then even if you have a faith up to here, you had the cancer and all, you are going to be healed. If you have a greater faith, you are going to be healed. If you have uh, even the highest faith, God is going, going to do even mightier miracles uh, for you. And that's why God wants to train us that we are going to grow in our faith in Jesus' name. And my prayer is that we are going to grow because a lot of people are waiting for us to grow in our faith that we can have a faith for them. We can lay hands on them and uh, the amputated arms are going to grow. But you need to go to that faith. I was reading the book of Kenneth Hagin from the time he started to be a pastor to the time that he entered into the healing ministry. He was praying for some people they were being healed left and right. But for the time they started to have now consistent miracles, 100%, 90%, and bigger cases, it took him 15 years. Because uh, your spirit man or your spirit woman need to go into the full measure of the stature of Christ in Jesus. There are some miracles here. Like I said to, uh, to, to Lulu yesterday, there are some things I don't even doubt at all. I have all the faith. Like when I said to Jim, though the doctor gave him a couple of uh, months, uh, stage four cancer, blah, blah, blah. He should set his house in order, sell everything, uh, divide everything because he's never going to, he's going to die. Uh, he was not even a Christian. But when I went away with Pastor Rosemary, I said to him, don't worry. My God is going to heal you. I have enough faith for the two of us. You don't even need to have any faith. Same way when I went to James, uh, Debbie's house, her husband also was diagnosed with cancer. They said he's not going to, to, to leave. You're not going to leave and so on and so forth. I say, no, there was another friend of ours. He's a minister as well. I was saying to you, know, I've buried 120 people since I was, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, how do you call it? Those people that are preaching in the hospital. Um, oh, I've forgotten the name. So I said to him, don't open the house to this guy anymore. As long as your door is opened. And I come here every Tuesday for the, the Bible study. I have faith you are going to be healed, full stop. You are not going to die. Of all that my father has given unto me, cancer is going to die. If you are not under the house of prayer for ownership, you are not my responsibility. But if you are under the house of prayer or your wife is under the house of prayer for ownership, then it is my responsibility. And I have lost none. And I have 100% faith for cancer for those who are under the house of prayer. For ownership, I don't need your faith. Like I said to the guy, come out of the house. He was angry. Uh, he, he said, come out of the house. Jesus kicked some people out of the, out of the house when he wanted to raise the daughter of uh, Jairus. Said, out. I don't need your unbelief here. So we need to go to that state in our faith where we shoulder the responsibility. Moses carried the whole nation on his shoulders. The people did not believe. As soon as he went on the mountain, even Aaron built the golden calf for the people. So Moses had, when they would cry to Moses, Moses would have to bring the bread for them through Moses. Like Jesus said, Moses gave you manna in the wilderness. It was not the faith, it was the faith of one man who sustained the whole nation through almost six million people. One. Uh, so he built his faith in such a, uh, to such an extent that uh, he carried the whole nation. And he, through, uh, through Hosea chapter 12, verse 13, by the hand of the prophet, Israel was delivered. And by the hand of the prophet, they were preserved. 
So we need to build up. The reason why we are losing the field, winning the field, is because uh, we are only giving the responsibility to the people. Like I was saying to Lulu yesterday, I knew how to receive healing for myself, but I did not know how to the, the people should receive their own healing because I know how I believe in my heart, but I don't know how you believe in your heart. I can inform your mind. At the time that uh, you you renew your mind and you believe right, it can take a long time, and sometimes people don't have that time. That's why we need to build up our faith. If it is muscles, we build up. I used to do body lifting, so even uh, dry without even exercise, I could bench uh, 60 kg. Even if I have not trained for six months, I could just come and bench immediately 60 kg. But I started with uh, 10, 20, because I built uh, muscles and my muscles had memory. That's why it, there's a price to pay. When the AA Alan also it took him about 15 years, he already was preaching, but God had to remove a lot of things in his own life, correct things. And until now, you could see now those spectacular miracles of the bones being created, that the monkey child, the face changing, the DNA changing, 100% uh, miracles for all the cancers, all the tumors. It took time for God to transform him, and God had to purify him. Basically, in the small book, The Price for a Miracle, he was talking about God perfecting him. Well, he was not an apostle, he was an evangelist mainly. But thank God for what he wrote. But truly, it is basically the perfect redemption plan. How God works with us, purges us. There are lots of things that God needs to remove, that his power can flow through us. And if we are not willing to, to die to those things, our generation is going to suffer because they've served their own generation. They showed the power to their own generation. They've gone to glory. It's our responsibility now to serve our own generation. And we need to build up our faith. When people come to us, the elders in those days, in the days of the book of James, the elders were the one that was supposed to pray the prayer of faith for the new convert. They were not requiring the convert to have any faith at all. We, the elders, are going to pray. But today, the elders of the church, what do they do? Nothing. So we need to grow in the faith. We need to develop in the faith. We need to, because it is not just us. A lot of the souls are at stake. And uh, unless people see signs and wonder, they will by no means believe. People have come to know that people don't hate God. People don't hate God. I say again, people don't hate God. They simply don't know the left from the right. Even when they are being foolish and they are being, uh, uh, they are persecuting you, attacking you, they truly don't hate God. When they see the goodness of the Lord, it leads them to repentance. Some of them are going to refuse forever, but let us prove to them that our God is alive. Let us address the problems of people. Fix it. My brother refused to go to the catechism, my younger brother. I went, my brother, my, my elder brother went, I followed my elder brother, but my brother did not. Even when we got saved, he refused to go. Uh, uh, why? Because he used to have a skin condition. And he said, that God is so good. Why does the does he not heal me? So that's what he was thinking. And so the priest used to come to her. My mom, she, she was spiritual, but she was not uh, born again. She loves the things that she, the priest was always coming to our house, uh, the exorcist, the priest, and so on and so The sons of Steve are worthless people, and pregnant my mom, my cousins, uh, worthless people, sons of Belial. But uh, my, my younger brother will not listen to those priests uh, because he said, if your God was right, why does he not heal me? I have the skin condition now. Even children don't want to play with me because they think it is contagious. So, though it is not contagious, but the children don't want to play with me. So, that was uh, his own thing. But when we became born again with my pastor, Jean-Francois, 
the first thing that God did was to heal my younger brother of that skin condition. And now you believe, and now, yes, now tell me more about that, Jesus. We want to hear Jesus. The reason why I believed in Jesus is because he healed my heart. That was the beginning. And now I want this Jesus. Let us present the real Jesus to him. He sets the captive free. Free in Jesus' name. So I will stop there. Is there any question? One question. Uh, Lynn, did you understand what I explained? Lynn Gyres. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Lydia, do you understand and do you have any question? Hi, I, 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 oh, sorry. I understood, but I think what I would just need to clarification in, I understand the perfect wholeness, which I think I'm understanding in terms of the physical completion. Is the soundest soul, um, perfect soundness only mental health or is it something else as well? It is every, we preach your whole gospel, spirit, soul, and body. So when God, though it is applied here, the perfect wholeness and perfect soundness is applied here for the healing uh, of the spirit, uh, of the body, and of the mind. Uh, but it is also, that's why we are doing, um, the thing is for the, you are, you are going to get spirit, perfect uh, wholeness and perfect soundness in your spirit when you are born again. Because when you are born again, your spirit is dead. So it needs to be uh, life uh, or raised back from the dead. So when you are born again, then the, the Holy Spirit comes into your spirit and uh, quickens your spirit. And your spirit becomes dead to sin, but now alive to God. As for your, 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 your soul, your emotion, your intellect, your emotion, your intellect, uh we also need the wholeness in, the, in those emotions many people they were uh, right but with the wholeness of uh if it is not a mental so mental illness is uh, is very uh, uh, demonic if it is demonic god is going to, to take care of it if it is biological uh, thing because some of the, some neurons or genetic disorder then it is also uh it requires also a physical uh, healing or a physical uh, perfect uh, wholeness so not everything is a demon sometimes of course the underlying the cause is always a satan who comes to steal kill and destroy but sometimes there's not a demonic oppression there it's only the devil planted the seed when people were pregnant and uh, the brain did not develop properly or there was a genetic disease that he planted but now god i think we already saw it god is able to send his angel now to uproot every seed that he did not plant. If it is at the, at the DNA level, he's going to remove it. If we need the organ, then he's going to send an organ from his storehouse in heaven and bring that organ and place it in our body with our spirit in the name of Jesus. Now, there is also perfect wholeness and perfect sound in every aspect that pertains to life. Raising up the children, bringing the children, marriages. That one is still pertain to the soul and to the body, but not into sickness, but the way we are relating and connecting with one another. That one for it to happen, though we make prayers, but for it to happen also, people need to be taught the word of God about the marriage. You can, you if you don't know what God said about marriage, you cannot have that perfect uh, wholeness in that marriage. You cannot be mended or repaired the way God designed. If you want to have children, that are godly and so on and so forth. I was talking to my spiritual mother yesterday and she was confessing that actually she's uh, reading some uh, Jewish uh, book. I said, yes, that's what the Lord said to me because uh, they, are, they are teaching from Genesis to Malachi. You already told them uh, it is in the Bible and everything is in the Bible, our Bible from Genesis to Malachi. We are trying to raise our children uh, according to the African culture, according to the European culture, according to the American culture. And we wonder why it is not working. Why not go back to the book? And she was confessing, yes, I want to write a book on Christian parenting, but I don't believe that I made the, I, I raise them properly, my own children. So I feel like I say, okay, you don't need to talk about your children, but 
from what you have learned, all the experiences uh, I've been uh, over here for all those 60 years, write something to help them because we need, we are losing our children, we are losing our marriages for people to have it. Thank God for the book that she wrote on the foundation of Christian marriage. Uh, but people don't know all those basic things. So how do you expect them to, to have a wonderful marriage? If those basics are not taught, people need to be taught, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So for the wholeness in emotions, people need to be taught how to feel, how to feel, how to react to situation. When you are taught, you don't react to situation, you act because you've been taught if you, this situation, this situation happened, this is how you respond. If this situation, this situation happened, this is how you respond. You no longer react because you've been trained. A medical doctor, if he sees someone dying, he's not screaming, ah! no. He has been trained in the case of uh, this, this. This is how you behave, this is how. Even when I was doing the care, when the patient would die, even the, the senior that was there, she was the, she was panicking. I would just be in control, not just the word of God. And I prayed for one of the ladies that died and she came back to life. By the time the, the paramedic came, she came back to life. So it was in a Catholic uh, Naz uh, Nazarene, uh, the sister of um, Nazarene, uh, something like that uh, here in Glasgow. And the nun, they told the mom, the, the nun, the head uh, nun, that this guy has raised the dead. So in the morning, so I was working for an agency. They, they came and said, no, we heard that you raised the dead. I said, well, we pray for the dead. So I called back the spirit. So we want to hire you. <laughs> Stay here for that. <laughs> so they called my agency. Whatever you ask, even if we need to pay him uh, 15, how, how much are you giving? Well, they said, we are giving um, uh, to 12 pounds per hour. And they said, OK, even 15 pounds per hour, we want to employ you. I said, I want to be employed for you. <laughs> I want my freedom to come as an agency and work when I want to work. If I'm employed by you, you are going to control my shifts. So, uh, but for that one, there is no renewing of the mind to raise the dead. You need to have 100% of the faith and take it up on your own shoulder. But for emotional healing and so on and so forth, people need to be taught how to think. So, but even for ministering healing, then also, there are, people also need to teach you when you see this kind of situation, don't panic. You believe this way in your heart. Believe this way in your heart and pray this way. That's why even just have to teach these people, this is how we pray. When you pray, say this. Listen to me. I'm praying in public because I want you to listen to what I'm saying and go do the same thing in the name of Jesus. So for wholeness, perfect wholeness and soundness, in our mind, in our emotions, in our um, the marriages, the children are bringing, that one will require the teaching of the word of God in those areas. For success in business and in life and connection, that will require a teaching. And uh, the reason why we are the perfect, this is Jehovah Rapha. It is that the Lord is my healer. That's why that wholeness and that perfection is only being applied to the area of the healing of the mind. And uh, but when I talk about the mind, it is um, mental illness and of uh, the body. Now, if we can apply the same scriptures now, if we want marriage, God wants to make your marriage whole. You want to make you emotionally whole, and so on, and so for heal the trauma in your life in Jesus' name. So that one will require teaching in that area. But wholeness is in every area of life in the name of Jesus. So is it clear? Yes, thank so, you. Okay, Lulu, do you have another question? Yes, please. Uh, it's according to Proverbs 17, 22. It says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bone. So does it mean the bone diseases are caused because of bitterness and unforgiveness? Not necessarily. Solomon is not writing about healing. 
though that scripture can be applied for healing, but he is not writing about the healing. A merry heart does a good like medicine. When you are a cheerful person and you are grateful, even medicine, it will. When you are joyful and it uh, releases some endo, uh, and endorphins, uh, I think that is the word um, in your in your body that makes you feel good. That uh, it uh, gets rid of the toxin in your body as well. So even doctors have realized people that are always joyful, smiling, there's less toxin in the body. So when you have a merry heart, it is good for your health. But uh, uh, I do call it uh, when you are depressed, give me that, um, uh, what is it? Look at it in, uh, you said it was uh, Proverbs. Uh, uh, 17, 22. Let me open my Bible first of all. Okay. Let's look at Proverbs 17, 22. Okay. Let me read from uh, uh, the Amplified Classic. You see, a happy heart is a, is a good medicine and uh, a cheerful uh, mind works uh, healing, but a broken spirit uh, dries up uh, the bone. So when someone is uh, happy, it is like a good medicine. And indeed, even doctors have, uh, uh, it releases good uh, chemicals. A cheerful mind, when you are cheerful in your mind, thinking positive and so on and so forth, uh, and not being a bitter, when you are bitter, the, the reason why sometimes, even with that evil spirit, even with that evil spirit, the reason why bitterness releases um, uh, sometimes cancers of the stomach, of the bowels, is because when you are bitter, uh, unforgiving, you become bitter, it releases uh, bad chemicals in your body, and which leads also medically, it has been proven that leads med medically also to some cancers, for instance. Uh, the bowel and so on and so forth. Uh, but here the broken, a uh, uh, broken spirit. Uh, when you have been wounded, when you've been wounded, the, the Bible here says it dry, uh, dries up the bone. When you have broken your spirit, when you have been hurt, wounded, uh, first of all, you're not going to be happy, you're not going to be cheerful. But also that depression that will that is going to come with that um, that brokenness of your spirit or of your of your heart. In here, spirit you can put the heart as well, because it is inter interchangeable. It will also cause a sickness in your body, because just like when people people were depressed, uh, they end up uh, being sick at the end if they don't uh, change the way they are thinking. They have bad toxins in the, in the body. That's why God doesn't want, he's always saying to us, rejoice, 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 because God knows how he created our bodies. He always asks us to forgive, forgive. God knows why he, he asks us to do that. Because if we have a broken spirit, uh, then uh, actually it is a sucking that, the, the dry, the picture of the dry bones at the light, it be sucked out of that uh, that bone. So when you have been hurt, it dries out. Uh, uh, the, um, the when you think of a bone, think of it as a structure, as a structure. As uh, that's why in Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven, bone came together, uh, bone against bone to form a skeleton. Think of it as a, a structure. If you are uh, or if you are broken in your spirit, you've been hurt and you are in a marriage or in a relationship, your life is going to be sucked out of that relationship. The, the, the life is going to be sucked out of that uh, marriage. If you have been cheated in business and you are so disappointed about your business partner, the life is going to be sucked out of that uh, business uh, 
uh, friendship or partnership. So that's what the, 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 the book of Proverbs sometimes is uh, spoken in um, poetic uh, language, especially also ecclesiastic and songs of songs. And you need to, to see it with your mind. The Bible paints a lot of pictures in our mind so that when we see it, we remember it. So when you are broken in your spirit, the light is talked out of uh, that uh, structure, that uh, organization, that organism, that relationship, the life is uh, drained out of it. And that's truly what happens. But if you are not broken hearted, when you see that business partner, when you see that spouse of yours, when you see that uh, friend of yours that has not broken your spirit or broken your heart, then uh, you are happy when you see them in your heart. So it is good that you are associating with them is actually building you up. You are always cheerful in your mind. So it is even a healing. When they speak to you, they're speaking nice words in your heart. You being associated with them is even a healing for your healing, for your emotions and many other things. But if they are breaking your heart, it drains all the life out of uh, you, out of that relationship, out of that institution, out of that the church. It drains the life out of it. So don't take it literally. Because a lot of people are right now, they now start to, the thing is, one of the things that we need to get away from in healing is that people sometimes want to look for formulas. So if uh, I see cancer of the bone, it means that the person is unforgiving. If I see cancer of the bowel, the person has bitterness. If I, and they have all those books in the uh, as spiritual technician or divine technicians, and they tell you if you see this, it means that this person has this. Yeah, sometimes even they, they give scripture, but that's not what it means. So people now, when they come, I have this cancer of the bone, or so, oh, you are unforgiving. I have this cancer of the bowel. You have bitterness. I don't. And they are now chasing for sickness, for, for sins in the lives of the people that people don't have. We need to have a relationship with God and ask God what is behind this thing. And then God is going to speak in Jesus' precious name. So it does not mean it literally. This is more of a speech or speech. Uh, if you're broken in heart, the, the life is going to be sucked out of that, uh, that relationship, that structure. Uh, that the body, the life is going to be sucked. Just like when you have been heartbroken, you, are, you feel so miserable that you don't want even to go take your shower, you stay uh, in your bedroom for many days, and so on and so forth. When a widow, for instance, a woman becomes a widow, so that she will not take a bath for 40 days, and according to the Jewish tradition. So why don't you want to take your bath? Because your the life is drained out of you, you are broke, bro, broken um, hearted. The life is being drained out of you. You don't feel like doing anything. So that's the, the picture that you need to have in your in your head. Not a literally it's going to cause bone cancer and so on and so forth. So let's let's uh, get away from those kind of teaching and uh, be balanced in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Our time is uh, far spent.